Okay, so here's where we were last time. We were talking about uh, real symmetric matrices. Well, I mean, that was the application we got to, um, real symmetric matrices and what we can conclude about them. What we had been talking about was this weird little world that we created in, in CN. Remember uh, CN? Uh, let me go back to it. Uh, CN, it's a lot like RN. Uh, it's just ordered in tuples of complex numbers instead of real numbers. Right. Um, so um, we've we've ventured into CN a few times in the past. Didn't really talk about it. Kind of swept that little detail under the rug. Again, mea culpa. Right. Uh, but it was kind of on purpose. I mean, I, again, I didn't want to deal with the uh, um, with the additional additional. Oh gosh, I'm trying to avoid saying complexity. Um, the additional difficulty there, right? Um, until uh, until we really needed to, and now we really do. So in CN, we get a new notion of dimension when we allow complex coefficients, right? Um, so that's weird. Uh, we get a new dot product. The old dot product we have to chunk, right? Because uh, it uh, doesn't. Uh, I mean, it does some really unacceptable things. Um, so we get a new kind of a dot product called the Hermitian dot product. And every new concept that we get, we think about, well, how does that, I mean, does that fit in like it's supposed to with, you know, existing concepts that we had in RN? And well, no, it didn't. And so we have to keep tweaking, you know, one thing after another for everything to fit. So uh, we tweaked the idea of transpose. Transpose doesn't really make any sense anymore in this context. Permission transpose is our new sort of replacement idea. Uh, symmetry, not really that interesting in this context. It's Hermitian symmetry, which again, you know, it, people what they actually call it is Hermitian. But again, when you when you hear Hermitian, I encourage you to think Hermitian symmetric. Um, new sort of uh, analog of symmetry. Okay. All right, so with that being the case, we started thinking about real symmetric matrices, which are Hermitian, and we made an argument last time that shows that, amazingly, uh, its eigenvalues are always real. And uh, th this is in this is in stark contrast to uh, to our you know our general experience with matrices. You know, real matrices in general absolutely could have complex eigenvalues for sure. Right. Um, this just says that well, if it's a symmetric real matrix, then we'll always have real eigenvalues. Now, I think it's a fun little exercise uh, at this time uh, to think about how would you prove this fact um, without all of this Hermitian stuff uh, that we just got through, um, uh, you know, developing. I mean, in other words, if you were to take just take a plain old Section 5.4 approach to this and just, you know, write down a generic, tell you what, let's just simplify it down to merely three by three matrices, right? You write down a generic symmetric matrix, work out its characteristic polynomial, just even finding those roots, it'd be a cubic equation. Oh my gosh, it seems like it'd be just a terrible nightmare. Uh, and it would. Right? So this lovely little argument here allows us to skip that entire, um, you know, horrifying calculation that would otherwise have been. Okay. All righty. So um, next theorem that I want to talk about. Uh, also for real symmetric matrices, further conclusions that we can that we can uh, get to uh, about these matrices. Um, if you look at it, two different eigenvalues and their associated eigenvectors, those eigenvectors are orthogonal. So the, the casual way that people like to say this is um, the eigenvectors are orthogonal. And that's sometimes true. Um, <coughs> eigenvectors are orthogonal, right? Um, Specifically, though, this is only for eigenvectors for different eigenvalues. And you, you do have to throw in this little asterisk here because obviously, I mean, think about uh, think about two different eigenvectors for the same eigenvalue. Well, they could be parallel, right? Um, they could be what they could be part of the same plane, and they could well inside of a plane. There's just loads of different directions that are clearly not orthogonal. Okay. All right. So, but for different eigenvalues. Orthogonal. Alrighty. 
Um, so how are we going to prove this one? And it's another one of these little uh, bank shot type arguments where we're going to start with something that does not immediately seem to be what we're interested in. Uh, and amazingly, we're going to get to where we want to go even though we start in seemingly the wrong direction. So uh, step one, the matrix is Hermitian, her, a.k.a. Hermitian symmetric. So you can whip it over to the right side of that Hermitian dot product. Um, step two, don't forget v one's an eigenvector. v is an eigenvector. Right, different eigenvalues, lambda 1 and lambda 2. Uh, again, don't forget we can factor out scalars out of Hermitian dot products. And we can factor out this scalar from a Hermitian dot product. Now, whoa, hey, slow down. Uh, that scalar is on the right. Don't forget we have a, a new rule. Right? The Hermitian dot product is not exactly like the old dot product. You can't just factor things out. So we should have a, a knee-jerk reaction where we think, hey, wait a minute, don't I have to conjugate that? Um, but in this case, we don't because we already know that the eigenvalues are all real. And the conjugate of a real eigenvalue is just itself. Um, and then uh, having done that, take this term, move it over to the other side, factor, you get this result. And um, by assumption, we're taking two different eigenvalues. Therefore, that's non-zero. Therefore, you can cancel it. And as desired, we see that these two vectors are orthogonal. And that's, uh, that's all there is to it. It's another, like I say, it's a deceptively simple. Um, seems like it ought to be more work than that. Right? But uh, there it is. So anyway, it's kind of one of these weird things. Uh, sometimes mathematicians develop ideas that seem really sophisticated and uh, abstruse, and uh, unexpectedly they have really natural and important um, uh, consequences. Keep in mind, we're talking here, our only assumption is that this matrix is real and symmetric, like a Hessian matrix. Again, kind of a big deal, right? There's nothing weird about considering a real symmetric matrix. Knowing that the eigenvalues are all real, the eigen um, vectors are all real, the eigenvectors are orthogonal, that's a really handy information to know. Okay. Okay. All right. Um, there's more that we know. Um, I, it's going to take me a few minutes to build up to this next thing that I want to tell you about real symmetric matrices. Um, I want to start with a definition of what it means for a matrix, uh, two matrices to be orthogonally similar. Uh, let me just remind, first off, we'll start off with a reminder. Here's what it means for two matrices to be similar. Right, that one's a conjugate of the other. Change a basis if you prefer, um, most of the time. I think that's a nicer way to think about it. Here I'm just going to, yeah, partly for sort of notational convenience, I'm just going to write as a conjugation. Okay, so that's what similarity means. Um, the similarity comes from the fact that this matrix P exists. Uh, there is an invertible matrix for which this equation works. So the mere existence of P is what gives you the similarity. Um, I'll point out, though, that um, that P might have some sort of properties. P might be special beyond just, of course, being invertible. Um, and th the big idea here is that, well, look, uh, whatever special features P has, in a way, tells you how you achieved that similarity, right? P is the thing that allows us to achieve the similarity. So if P is special, then that gives us a special sort of similarity. Right? Um, so along those lines, uh, let's look at... Um, uh, this idea here, let's suppose that uh, A and B are similar. Namely, one's a conjugate of the other. A and B are similar. Well, if P, the, the matrix that achieves the similarity, if it has a feature such as it's orthogonal, it kind of stands to reason to modify the term and say that not only are A and B similar, a and B are similar by way of a special matrix. The, the way that we get to the similarity is by way of something orthogonal. 
or just to be succinct, we say that these two matrices are orthogonally similar. Okay, so anyway, that's the uh, that's the idea for the terminology. Uh, strictly speaking, the definitions as written, but I think it makes sense. Is I think it's plausible choice of terminology because uh, again, any description uh, it, or orthogonal here is a, a, a description of the way that we got the similarity. So orthogonal similarity seems to make sense. Okay, so for your uh, digestion. Um, uh, very, very analogously, uh, a matrix is diagonalizable uh, if it's similar to a diagonal matrix. And so, likewise, uh, any characteristics that P has, P being the thing that allowed us to do that diagonalization, right? Any feature that that has describes the nature of the diagonalizability. So uh, if A is diagonalizable um, by an orthogonal matrix, um, then we say it's orthogonally diagonalizable. And that's a mouthful, by the way. Orthogonally diagonalizable takes a little bit of practice to get that to roll off the tongue nicely. Um, and uh, but the uh, different variations, by the way, will refer to this as A's or orthogonal diagonalizability, right? Same idea, different grammar. Okay. All right. Um, let me uh, pause here for a moment, see if anybody has any questions. How are we doing? Okay. Just a bunch of lingo. So here's the additional information that I can tell you about real symmetric matrices. Real symmetric matrices are orthogonally diagonalizable. And um, <clears throat> this shouldn't be terribly surprising in light of what we already know about real symmetric matrices. Let me remind you what we know about real symmetric matrices. Uh, we know the eigenvalues are real. Uh, we know the eigenvectors are real. Well, the eigenvectors, the eigenvectors are how you diagonalize things, right? So that is at least kind of pointing in the direction of diagonalizability. We know what these eigenvectors are. Uh, furthermore, the last theorem uh, that, we, that we proved on the previous page was that the eigenvectors are orthogonal. So there's the orthogonally part of orthogonally diagonalizable. In fact, so we already know most of what it needs most of what we need to show this uh, this result, we're really only missing one thing. We kind of already know the orthogonally business. It's just that diagonalizable requires that there be a full spread of eigenvectors. There can't be any missing eigenvectors. You have to have the maximum number of eigenvectors. So that's really the only new information here. Right. Um, a lot of this, it was uh, we were sort of already moving in that direction. So, um, so in this case here. I'm going to I'm just going to say uh no missing uh eigenvectors. And saying that the matrix is orthogonally diagonalizable is just a kind of a crisper way uh to say that there are no missing eigenvectors. Okay. Um Proving this fact is a little harder than uh, we really quite have time for. I have proved it in past semesters, and it just it takes some time, and um, it's just not worth the 20 minutes, I think, as far as Math 216 is concerned. So you're not responsible uh, for, uh, for why this is true. You're just responsible for knowing that it is true. Okay. All right. Now, while we're here, uh, it makes sense to let you know about another result. This is called Schur's theorem. Um, <clears throat> it's not a weaker result. It's not a stronger result. It's a. It's a. It's an, a nearby result, you might say. So um, let me uh, first tell you what it says. It says if you have a matrix with all real eigenvalues, then that matrix is orthogonally similar to an upper triangular matrix. So you can kind of see the a lot of the same earmarks, right? I mean, there's an orthogonal similarity in the conclusion. There's an orthogonal similarity in this conclusion. Uh, different, of course. 
Um, so let me point out first, in this first theorem, we assume we have a real symmetric matrix. Um, that would imply that the matrix has all real eigenvalues. Right, so just a, a first little quick observation. Now, what, what would be the, the suggestion of this? Here we have a theorem with uh, a, uh, a, a strict condition. Here we have a theorem with a less strict condition. That makes Schur's theorem look like a better theorem. Right, it's, it applies more broadly. Every real symmetric matrix has real eigenvalues, but plenty of matrices have real eigenvalues that aren't symmetric. So broader application in Schur's theorem. Um, but along those same lines, orthogonal diagonalizability implies uh, what you might call orthogonal upper triangularizability. Right? Um, so again, um, you know, it's it's not a better worse kind of thing, but Schur's theorem gets a um, uh, gives a stronger result. Orthogonally diagonalizable means that it's orthogonally conjugate to a diagonal matrix. That's a very strict thing. Orthogonally similar to an upper triangular matrix. <coughs> it's, a, it's, a, it's, a, it's a weaker conclusion, right? It's not as it's not as specific. So, uh, so that's the weird thing. Schur's theorem applies more broadly, but um, it has a weaker punchline. So in a way, it's a stronger theorem. In a way, it's a weaker theorem. But certainly, it's a related theorem. Right? So anyway, keep that in mind. So uh, this theorem, pros and cons. Um, this theorem, different pros, different cons. Okay. All right. Um, now I want to tell you one more thing about Schur's theorem. Um, <clears throat> by the way, we're not going to prove Schur's theorem in this class. You're not responsible for knowing why it's true. Just that it's true. Um, there is a uh, there's a complex version uh, of this. Uh, notice that the there, this is a sort of a specifically a real theorem. We have a matrix with real eigenvalues, right? And it is orthogonally. Similar to an upper triangular matrix, an orthogonal, uh, an orthogonal matrix as we've defined it right now is just a real matrix. So this is all real. So I want to talk about the analogous thing in the complex setting. So just a reminder, um, here's our definition of an orthogonal matrix. Orthogonal matrix is a matrix whose columns are an orthonormal basis for Rn. Okay, um, and uh, then uh, you can prove, and we did this uh, in the notes. You can prove that that means that P transpose is P inverse. And that's a pretty straightforward proof. Again, it's in the notes. You can look back and see how that proof went. We we literally just multiplied P transpose times P, and we brute forced that calculation rows dot columns, and sure enough, we got the identity matrix. Okay. All right, so here's here's the analogous idea. Let's consider, instead of uh, orthogonality, let's consider Hermitian orthogonality. Right? Let's consider complex matrices, and I mean the the analog to uh, inner product. Or let's okay. The analog of dot product equals zero is. Permission dot product equals zero. So it seems like a pretty natural thing to want to talk about. So that analogous uh, concept, you know, a matrix whose columns are permission orthonormal. Um, the word for that is a weird choice. Not clear where this comes from. It is called a unitary matrix. Um, and uh, uh, you know, don't, don't worry about uh, where it came from. So anyway, the big way to think about unitary a unitary matrix, think in, in the same sense that Hermitian is the uh, Hermitian analog of symmetric. And Hermitian transpose is just the Hermitian version of transpose. And Hermitian dot product is the Hermitian version of dot product. You know, we're in this Alice in Wonderland kind of, everything's kind of vaguely familiar, but everything's weird and different. Right? Um, unitary is just the Hermitian version of 
of orthogonality for a matrix. Okay. All right, so uh, that being um, defined, uh, there's a couple of results that I want you all to, to do as practice problems. I think these are great practice problems. First thing to do, you can totally do this on your own. Um, confirm that a matrix is unitary if and only if its Hermitian transpose is its inverse. Namely, that P star P is the identity. Um, note um, the, how strongly analogous that is to the, the real result up there with transpose. The way you're going to prove this is by shamelessly looking at how we prove the result directly above it. I just flip back in the notes to where we did that in section 9.2 and kind of copycat. Adapt appropriately, of course, or you've got to adapt it as needed, but that strategy will allow you to prove that uh, result. So I think that's a wonderful practice problem. I want to encourage everybody to give that a try. Of course, if you get stuck, it's a great question for office hours or TA office hours or discussion section or, or what have you. Um, the second practice problem that I want you all to try to do on your own uh, is this one. Again, totally analogous to a, 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 a very uh, analogous uh, result for orthogonal matrices. And that is in the same way that orthogonal matrices preserve real dot products, unitary matrices preserve Hermitian dot products. And again, the way you're going to prove this is you're going to look back to where in the notes we proved the analogous result for orthogonal matrices. And you're going to shamelessly copy, adapting appropriately as needed, and sure enough, it's going to work. Okay. So a couple of really good practice problems. I hope you'll uh, give those a try. Okay. So uh, with this uh, having been set up, uh, we now have what we need uh, to uh, generalize Schur's theorem. Um, first, we're going to generalize the idea of orthogonal similarity. There is a similarity if the matrix that does that is unitary, stands to reason to modify the statement as that these matrices are they're not just similar, they're unitarily similar. Because they're similar by way of a unitary matrix. Okay. And uh, with that um, uh, established, here's the complex version of Schur's theorem. It's not about orthogonal similarity, it's about unitary similarity. It's not about matrices with real eigenvalues, it's about matrices <coughs> with complex eigenvalues, which, by the way, of course, that's every square matrix has complex eigenvalues. I mean, the characteristic polynomial, polynomial um, it's got in roots, a.k.a. in eigenvectors. Um, and, uh, again, uh, unitarily similar to an upper triangular matrix, just like in the original theorem. So, so this is called the complex version of Schur's theorem. Um, and... Uh, I hope that makes sense as to why. Okay, again, don't worry about why Schur's theorem is true. Simply know that it's true. Okay. All right, pause real quick for questions. Anybody? Um, one of the most confusing things about this part of uh, section 9.3 is just the language, right? I mean, really getting comfortable with and digesting this idea of, you know, what it means for two matrices to be unitarily similar or orthogonally similar or what have you. Um, and uh, just, you know, kind of digesting the idea of, you know, why that grammar makes sense, you know, why this construction, this terminological construction makes sense. Okay. Okay, so uh, we're done with Chapter 9 now. Moving back to Chapter 6, uh, which we kind of jumped over uh, previously. Now coming back. Um, this is about uh, differential equations, so we're back to differential equations. Um, no surprise, it's about linear differential equations. Well, after all, this is a linear algebra class. Right? In fact, uh, let me say it again. I, I know I've said this before, but I think this is worth repeating. The original conception of this course uh, was to include, you know, if we're going to include some differential equations in with a linear algebra course, shouldn't it be 
the differential equations that are susceptible to methods of linear algebra. Right? And so it's really not a surprise that linear differential equations would be those differential equations. Okay, okay. so uh, previously in chapter four, we considered nth order differential equations. Now we're going to simplify things and talk about first order equations, at which point you might think, well, that's nice. Um, isn't this just an n equals one version of what we already did in chapter four? Well, if only. Um, the bad news is we're not going to be looking at just one equation at a time. We're going to be looking at what we call systems of differential equations. And that's going to be the sticky wicket. That's going to be what makes these problems hard to deal with. So in particular, um, because we have a system, here's an example of what a system uh, looks like. Uh, by the way, notice first order because the derivatives are only first derivatives. Um, <clears throat> I guess I'll leave that there. So what makes this hard is that you cannot just look at this one equation at a time. Uh, let, let's, for example, let's think about this first equation. Uh, can I just you know, ignore the rest of it and let's just solve this first equation and after we're done with the first equation, then we'll get around to thinking about subsequent equations. But the problem is this is an equation where I don't know why one Right? Don't know why one, but I also don't know why two, and I also don't know why three, and I don't know et cetera, et cetera, and I don't know why n. And if it only involved y ones and y one primes, then maybe I could solve it. But uh, how can I solve for y one when I don't know why n? There is a part of this purple equation that I don't even know what it is, namely y n. So you can't hope to solve for y1 by itself. You don't know y n yet. Okay, so then the thought is, all right, well then, okay, I'll, okay, fine. So y n is the problem. Okay, let me solve for y n first, and then I can go back and solve for y1. Same problem. This is what you might call the y n equation. I can't solve it because I don't know y1. And uh, likewise, I can't solve the y2 equation because I don't know y1 or y3 or y4 or y5, et cetera. So I don't know any of these functions to start off, and therefore I can't solve any of the equations individually. So nasty little problem. Um, so uh, one way to think of this is that these equations are uh, kind of interlinked. Uh, each equation, like the y1 equations involved in the y2 equation and the y3 equations involved in the y1 equation, etc. And it's we're trying to untangle a nasty little knot in some sense. Um, so hard problem. And it's going to take us a little while uh, to figure out how to do this. Um, it turns out there's some nice methods. Um, okay, so first of all, uh, let me point out a notational um, convenience. Uh, these functions that are the coefficients, you might say, of the functions that we're searching for. We lump them together as a matrix and call that the coefficient matrix. I, I think that's pretty natural seeming. Um, the, uh, the functions that I'm looking for, that I'm trying to solve for, y1, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera, through yn. I'm going to lump those all together as a single vector. Uh, doesn't really seem like a particularly natural choice, but I, I, mean, I guess we could, right? So let's just go ahead and do that for the moment. Um, uh, this thing over here, all these extra functions over here on the far right, I'm going to lump those together as a vector. And having done that, uh, notice what's really nice about this choice of notations uh, is that I can rewrite the whole thing as... Uh, a vector function multiplied by a matrix of coefficients, and uh, let's see, and then what color did I use? Oh, in green. Okay, and then uh, plus a vector of additional functions on the right. So the entire system of equations, this great big monstrosity up here that we're so scared of, uh, notice that it, at least notationally, we can simplify it very nicely. Uh, using uh, matrix and vector multiplication.
So most of the time, just a heads up, most of the time we're going to write things like this because it's, it's, it's much more compact, right, and um, ultimately more natural as well. Quick pause on this. How y'all doing on the the, uh, the statement of the question and the this notational uh, trick? Everybody happy? Okay. All righty. Um, by the way, one thing I want y'all to be on the lookout for um, as we go through chapter six, I want y'all to be on the lookout for strong similarities. I, I, analogies, I shouldn't say similar. A strong analogies between stuff that's happening in chapter six and stuff that already happened in chapter four. It's going to turn out that there's a lot of kind of, well, this is pretty much like that, but you know, different in uh, in, uh, in you know in a, some appropriate way. Um, so heads up. Okay. Uh, first example of that, uh, we're going to define what we mean by a homogeneous system, and it just means that uh, the stuff on the far right is equal to zero. Um, you might complain and say, "Well, wait a second, but isn't isn't it supposed to be the whole right hand side of the equation? Why are we not looking at the whole right hand side of the equation?" And so, let me address that by uh, rewriting uh, that equation as uh, uh, y prime minus a y. Uh, equals uh, g, and so notice now having rewritten it like this, it is the whole right hand side, <laughs> right? Um, so okay, uh, follow up question: If uh, if it, if I motivate the, the the terminology homogeneous by that being the only thing on the right hand side, namely by having written the equation like this on the left, why don't I do it that way in the first place? Why am I writing it like this over here? Right? If this is in, in at least one sense more natural. And th the answer is, is because in a different sense, this is more natural. And it's a way that's going to reveal itself soon. Uh, we're not quite ready for it uh, just yet. But uh, both of these um, notational choices make sense. Uh, this motivates that term more easily. And uh, this is going to motivate something else. So, um, you know, keep um, uh, keep your eyes open. That will be that will be coming along soon enough. Okay. All righty. Um, we um, have a notion of an initial condition. Right? In chapter four, we had initial conditions. This is what an initial condition looks like. Um, a differential equation combined with an initial condition. Just like in chapter four, we call that an initial value problem. Again, total ripoff on terminology from chapter four. Okay. Um, pretty reasonable question. Of why is this the definition of an initial condition? Right. Well, um, uh, why don't we have uh, maybe some derivatives of y in there? In, in chapter four, the initial conditions involve derivatives. Why not here? rhetorical question uh, would be a uh, great question and uh, the answer comes on the next page and that is um, with this theorem this is the existence and uniqueness theorem for initial value problems for systems of linear equations and uh, here it is so, uh, so there are certain conditions that have to be met we'll talk about those conditions in a moment but the big idea is that under certain conditions initial value problems have solutions, namely solutions will exist, and furthermore, solutions will be unique. Um, so thus the terminology, right? So I'll, I'll be referring to this as the existence and uniqueness theorem uh, for these kinds of differential equations because that's what it says. It says initial value problems have existence and uniqueness. And so now let me get back to the, you know, again, why why do we define an initial condition the way we do? Uh, it is so this theorem will work. This notion of an initial condition, that's the notion of initial condition that makes uh, an existence and uniqueness theorem uh, a true statement. If you were to change 
this and say, well, uh, you know, I just kind of feel like there should be some derivatives involved. If you were to make a, an initial value, a, 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 um, uh, a more strictly defined thing, you know, it involved more conditions, then you would not have the existence property. And if you were to lighten this up, if you were to kind of really reduce the slack, you know, uh, um, make a more, more flexible notion of an initial condition, then you wouldn't have the uniqueness property, right? It's exactly this notion of an initial condition that gives you both existence and uniqueness. Okay, so I think that's a, a, a pretty nice point of view. Uh, it's it's the notion of initial values. That's critical to make the theorem work. Okay. All righty. And uh, uh, proving, proving this theorem uh, well beyond what we can reasonably do in this course. Uh, so uh, we're going to take this as just a given. Just like we did in Chapter 4. The analogy continues. Okay. All right, so uh, I want to recognize that what we've written down here so far about Chapter 6, differential equations, it seems very calculus-like. Uh, we're talking about differential equations and functions and solutions and derivatives. And it seems like very calculus-like analysis kind of stuff. Um, why is this in a linear algebra class? And uh, there's a great reason for this. Uh, as I already said, it's going to be highly susceptible to methods of linear algebra. And I want to kind of start rephrasing things in those terms. So let's look at these homogeneous solutions. And again, homogeneous first. We'll get to the non-homogeneous stuff a few sections later. Um, so uh, yeah, so that's a differential equation. Vector differential equation, I suppose you might say. System of differential equations, if you prefer. Um, and let's think about what those solutions are. Well, if you think about it, here's what a solution looks like. It's a an ordered n-tuple of functions. And uh, it can be shown, and this isn't that hard to do, that if you look at the collection of all ordered n-tuples of functions, specifically all ordered n-tuples of C1 functions, um, that's a vector space. Oh, uh, sorry, green. It's a vector space. So so if you, look, if you want to insist on taking an analysis point of view on this, nah, I, I suppose you could, but it's extremely limiting. It's going to end up being very powerful to realize that I'm not looking for things that do calculus facts. I'm looking for a vector and a vector space. Right? Let's think about this in terms of linear algebra. Um, in fact, furthermore... Not only am I looking for a vector in a vector space, well, there might be more than one solution. In fact, the set of solutions is a subspace of that vector space. How do I know that it's a subspace of the vector space? Well, because um, solving this differential equation here is equivalent to setting this linear transformation equal to zero. And so notice then, I am looking for, when I say I'm looking for a set of solutions, I'm looking for a kernel of a linear transformation. And we already know from, what is it, chapter five, section, uh, I think it's section 5.1, uh, I left it as an exercise for y'all, uh, to show that the kernel of any linear transformation always a subspace of the domain. So so that's what I want to encourage you all to do um, uh, to uh, uh, reconsider all of this business about uh, you know, we, we've got a system of equations and we're looking for functions you know, ordered in tuples of functions that do calculus facts. Right? T try to think of it less in those terms and think instead that we are doing business inside of a vector space we're looking for vectors in a vector space, specifically a subspace, namely the kernel of a certain linear transformation. And notice that that's all linear algebra talk, right? So this is not 
Well, don't think of this as being a calculus problem. Think of this as being a linear algebra problem, and ultimately that's how we're going to solve it. Okay, so I, I think that context is good uh, to get out there. Um, okay, so um, just like in Chapter 4, homogeneous system, the solutions are a subspace of dimension in just like in chapter four. Um, the way you prove this is just like the way we proved the result from chapter four. And let me remind you, the way we proved the, the result from chapter four was we waited until chapter five. We waited until we had the more powerful tools of uh, linear transformations to be able to do that. And I'm gonna flip back over to it here. Um, this is from uh, the end of section 5.1, you know, the lecture notes, of course, end of section 5.1. And uh, recall that uh, we defined a certain linear transformation. Specifically, a linear transformation from the set of solutions that I'm trying to understand into the set of initial values, the set of initial conditions, you might call them, Right? We define this linear transformation by this formula. Real simple formula. If you give me a solution, the value of the transformation is, well, whatever its initial values are. Right? That's what this formula says. So we define a linear transformation. All you've got to do to finish the rest of this proof is, well, in fact, prove that this is linear. Um, show that this linear transformation is one to one and onto both of these results, these last two of which, that come directly from the existence and uniqueness theorem. Right? And well, hey, we have a one to one and onto linear transformation, one to one and onto linear transformations, the domain and the target have the same dimension. And there you go, there is, uh, there is the result, um, very nice result. If you just, again, shamelessly copy uh, the ideas, the strategy in that proof that I just reminded you of, you know, to sort of walk you through again, um, and just apply them to this situation, right? Uh, think about how this, uh, we can talk about a set of solutions. We can talk about the set of initial conditions. We can define a linear transformation that says if you give me a, a solution, I give you the corresponding initial conditions. Prove it's linear. Kind of plugging in. Prove that it's one to one and on to. Comes automatically from the existence and uniqueness theorem. And then snap your fingers and you're done. Um, and uh, therefore we have a the set of solutions is n-dimensional. So I think this is a great exercise. I want to encourage everybody to take a crack at that. Uh, again, as always, when I make these recommendations in class, uh, you know, if you get stuck, come to office hours, go to TA office hours, ask a friend, uh, ask in discussion section. Uh, but this is a, a nice thing to nice thing to take a take a try at. Okay. Okay. I, I, a couple of bits of terminology and notation. Again, we're just laying groundwork at this point. Uh, we'll get to actually solving differential equations uh, soon. It'll probably be Monday. Um, fundamental set of solutions. Uh, it's exactly what you think it is. It's a basis for the vector space of solutions. So, of course it is. Um, when you have such a basis, now uh, in Chapter 4 when we had a basis of functions, Oh, well, um, there it is. <laughs> it's a basis of functions. Not much you can do with that exactly. Here, I'm going to make the observations that because each of these is, in fact, a vector, right? Each one of those is a vector. You can lay them out and make a matrix. Seems, uh, hmm, it's not clear why we would want to make a matrix out of a bunch of vectors, but then again, there have been so many instances in this class so far where when you have a bunch of vectors, you kind of cram them together and make a matrix out of them, and good stuff happens, right? We've seen any number of examples of that. So, kind of plausible that maybe we want to do this. Um, so, uh, so this thing here, the matrix whose columns are solution vectors, 
uh, we call, um, uh, well, the book calls this a matrix of fundamental solutions. Um, I, I, I just feel like that the words are in the wrong order in that statement. I would rather call it a um, fundamental solution matrix. I just think that makes more sense. It's not like any one of the solutions individually is a fundamental solution. It's just that's not what it is. Right, so I just feel like the book's construction there is just grammatically awkward, but eh, whatever. Okay, um, so uh, don't forget each one of these solutions has a bunch of different coordinates. This is one solution, what I have circled here, this thing called the Y1 vector, that is one solution. Don't forget we're solving systems here. A system has as a solution a list of functions that you put all into the system all at the same time to make all of the equations in the system work. So uh, each column is a solution. Okay. And by the way, you do have to be careful uh, <laughs> with the uh, indices. So uh, awkwardly here, I'm using y. I'm using subscripts one through n to distinguish different solution vectors from each other. Back here, I was using subscripts. Oh, here, let me do it over here. Uh, subscripts one through n to distinguish the different coordinates within a single solution. This is an unavoidable problem. We have uh, different needs to di distinguish from e things from each other, and they are both important. Right? So they're going to be there. So it heads up, and uh, you'll notice that the way I wrote this uh, here, um, each one of these functions has uh, two subscripts, right? uh, one indicating which vector solution are you talking about, and the other indicating which coordinate of that vector solution are you talking about. Okay. Okay. Okie dokie. So um, let's do one. Let's actually solve uh, one of these equations. It's uh, not that hard to do. Uh, here is one such system. And just as a quick reminder, uh, don't forget what this actually says is y1 prime equals 1y1 minus 3y2. Uh, y2 prime equals negative 2y1 plus 2y2. These are the same thing. You can think of... Um, the, the matrix equation down here is just a nice, compact shorthand for this, right? which, is a, which is nice. But again, it's more than that. This isn't just a shorthand. There's also, now we've, having written it with matrices, we have the advantages that we can use matrix algebra, and that's a nice thing. Okay. So, but just don't forget what, uh, what this is a representation of. Um, so... Again, not a calculus problem. It's a linear algebra problem. This is a two-by-two two matrix. We instantly know that there's a two-dimensional vector space is what I'm trying to solve for. Right? Two-dimensional. Linear algebra concept. Right? Two-dimensional. Um, and uh, then I'm going to observe that I have two actual solutions. Now this is this is actually a little bit of calculus, and you got to kind of you know brute force this. But if you take that vector and plug it in, it works. Or you know, said differently, if you take this vector, if you take this ordered pair of functions y1 and y2, and if you plug it into the system that we have up there, then the system works. Same thing. Take your pick, your preference. Um, so that's a solution. Uh, whoops, that is a solution. And likewise, this is a solution. Again, take your pick how you want to see that. Okay. So now that's a little bit of calculus, and it's sort of observational. But oh, come on, check it out. I mean, I, I'm not telling you where I got these from just yet, right? I'm going to keep that behind, you know, behind the curtain. I'll uh, I'll pull back the curtain on that um, on Monday probably, but. Um, Calculus shows that these are solutions. And now, continuing on with the linear algebra, I have an independent pair of solutions. Clearly independent. These vectors point in different directions. This one points in the direction of negative 1, 1. This one points in the direction of 3, 2. They're, they point in different directions. They're clearly independent. 
So I have two independent vectors in a two-dimensional vector space, and therefore they form a basis, and therefore their span is the entire vector space. And therefore this is the entire set of solutions. Everybody on board? So I, again, it kind of seems like a little bit of a magic trick. Um, we, uh, we dumb luck into a solution. We stepped our toe on another solution. We have two solutions. There's infinitely many solutions out there. We found two out of infinitely many. Uh, but uh, we wave the magic wand of linear algebra, and poof, we're done. We found all of them. And we know that we found all of them. Again, because of the linear algebra. Yes? And it's given that this is a two dimensional solution, or we just know it's no, we, we know, no, we, it's, uh, we, we know because of a theorem. This theorem hit here says that the set of solutions is n dimensional, where n is the, the, the shape of the matrix. Yeah. Okay, this is a good stopping point. We'll see you all uh, later. See you on Friday. Uh, stopping right here.